Single one? No, there it is. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is some concepts around our tools. I'm not going to get into the technical details of the tools. That's a different discussion for either papers or for side conversations. But I want to give you a sense of why we built what we built and why that might or how you might be able to utilize some of this type of technology. So just for bookkeeping, we've been funded by NSF. We've primarily been funded by NIH and we've had some IARPA money uh, for one particular project. Uh, the MD2K team is a very large center. Uh, there's about seven, we've had about 76 faculty, staff, and students kind of go through its umbrella. And it covers everything from behavioral science to computing to medicine and engineering. Now, I know Bonnie's in the room and Vivek's in the room. These are all people that have been around for pretty much the existence of the center. Bill, Billy's here somewhere too, if she's in the room. Billy's part of this as well. Billy, there she is. Oh, there, there she is. <laughs> Anyways, so, so this is all housed at the University of Memphis, kind of as an organization. This is the team that I work with. Um, I have a bunch of computer, computer, computer engineers, uh, many with PhDs. Uh, these, are the, these, are the, these are the individuals that have built the software. And we have a couple people that have really been dedicated to testing this. So one thing we noticed early on is if the engineers build the software and the engineers test the software, the rest of you can't use the software uh, because we have some inherent assumptions about how things work and we built it. Uh, so we, we like to have these two individuals, Shahan and Brian, just as a sanity check. Give, give the software to them, let them, let them use it, let them break it, let them tell you what's wrong with it. Uh, so this was very important to us. So the MD2K vision was built around this concept of detect, predict, and act. Uh, so you want to detect an event, smoking or stress or some sort of other behavior. You want to act on that. And then you want to deliver an intervention or some sort of prompt to them. Uh, we've done this in a number of cases, whether it's congestive heart failure, oral health. Okay, he's sitting right there. Uh, that's his project. Uh, cocaine abuse, things around the workplace, or even eating behaviors. Uh, so <coughs> what I'm talking about is how we've kind of built this pipeline of detecting, predicting, and acting on it. So where did this start? Uh, MD2K, prior to the center, there was a project called Fieldstream. This was five graduate students running a couple participants at a time uh, for an entire study. It was very, very labor intensive. And the process was give them a phone with some sensors, hope it works. When the phone comes back to the lab, download the data, load it into MATLAB, and see what happens. I mean, that was, that was the premise before the center existed. Um, then we came along, MD2K was created. We needed to scale it. Uh, so we, we said, okay, well, let's just open source the software. Let's give this out to anybody that potentially wants it. Let's build some sensor triggered interventions into it. And let's enable something called remote data collection, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Uh, this also expanded our capabilities. We started running larger studies. Now we're running 10, 20, 30, 40 participants at a time in the field. Uh, as we've evolved, new projects come online. Um, but prior to this point, it was, here's a phone, right? Let me collect that data from that phone. And you have to carry two cell phones with you. Now, 2010, we're, st we're still in the smartphone era, but uh, people don't, don't like carrying two phones. Uh, one to collect data, one to answer the prompts on, and then their own personal phone. So we, we basically spent a lot of time optimizing this, running it on their own devices, um, added a bunch of metadata, which is very useful for the researchers, and added a bunch of features. This, this particular project scaled to about 440 individuals concurrently running data into the system. Um, and then as we, as we kind of go beyond looking at, at this year and, and kind of beyond, we're starting to look at, can you do this as an individual, right? Can I, can I download the software, run it on my own phone, study N of 1? It's kind of like the, the small data concept here. Um, this can enable citizen science it, sciences, and then we're also starting to look at user engagement type capabilities. Um, so, why do I say this? Uh, everybody's seen these devices, whether it's Fitbit or Apple Watch or an Android Wear or Wear OS. They're great. They produce features, biomarkers, call them what you want. These go into their, their respective databases. Now, these are relatively low frequency. 
Uh, they're great for researchers. And if this is what you have and this is what you're working with research, uh, you can do a lot of, lot of good things here. Right? This is markers, interventions, self-reports. Uh, where MD2K fits in the picture is actually prior to this. What we're talking, what I'm going to talk about is really how do you build those markers that you can then use within your research. Uh, so this allows us, this platform kind of allows us to get, get at lab data, get at labeled data collection in the field, get at ground truth information. Um, and so we kind of essentially going to talk about something called MCerebrum, which is the mobile platform, and Cerebral Cortex, which is our cloud platform. These are the two kind of pieces of software that we built to enable this. And this is why collecting all this data is so important. So just to put a size perspective on it, in any particular study of ours, we're collecting on, on the order of 70 million samples a day from an individual. Uh, that is streamed into a single cell phone. And those cell phones in aggregate have, have streamed up to 200 gigabytes of data a day to the cloud services. Uh, this is a scale far larger than what most people deal with, but this is what we built the platform to do. Uh, to give you kind of perspective of some of our studies, Bonnie, this is your study. <laughs> right, we, we started with a very small study with MD2K, well, small, it's 125 or so individuals, uh, generated about nine terabytes of data. Uh, as we've progressed through different types of studies, smoking, cocaine, uh, behavior change, uh, we keep growing our data set. Uh, then Vivek showed up, and he added a bunch of data to it. <laughs> now, this is still ongoing, so this is, this is, this is the expected <coughs> data. So he added a bunch of data to this, and then we had that, that other 400-person study, which was gigantic on, on job performance. So in total, we've run, or actually we're going to run, around the or on the order of 2,200 uh, 2, participants. Uh, it's going to be over 100,000 participants' days of data that we've collected within the platform, and it's about 300 terabytes of information. Uh, so that's the data set that we get to play with. I get to look at running machine learning algorithms on top of very large data sets. So, um, Anytime, stop me, ask questions. Uh, but I'll move on to MCerebrum, which is our mobile interface. What this really enables us to do is collect high rate external raw sensor data. So these are smart toothbrushes, custom sensors, scales, blood pressure cuffs. Uh, all of that streams in over wireless connections to the cell phone, plus the onboard sensors. That's what we're collecting and storing. Um, uh, this is, I think, especially important given some of the conversations I was in on yesterday. Uh, when you deploy this in the field, how does your participant know that it's working? It's something to think about when you have sensors. So it's very important that you have some sort of status information available to them on that cell phone screen. Uh, what you don't want is a, a black wristband that has no display on it that they can just say, well, I put it on, I don't know if it's working. Uh, so being able to provide that information to them is especially important. Um, if you're a study coordinator and you're saying, well, for whatever reason, you already know the data is bad, how do you tell them to fix it? Uh, and everything I'm telling you is, is things that we've run into. Um, so having that status information on the, on the phone screen, and you'll see an example of it later, I have a, I have a, a, a demo where it shows you this. Uh, but equally important uh, from a participant standpoint is privacy. So we actually adopted a, a privacy first uh, model in our, in our software platform. What this means is the participants in the field on the software have the ability to disable data whenever they feel like it uh, with software controls. And we basically ensured and, and built it so that we never store the data if it's ever been disabled uh, in, in real time. Uh, in the past, we've had uh, problems. Uh, one, of the, one, of the one of the sensors was a chest band that had two, two electrodes that stuck to the chest for ECG purposes. And as you can imagine, it was annoying to put on. It was really annoying if it failed, and you didn't want people taking it off. But there are instances where I don't, they say, I don't, want, I don't want you to see my data. So they would just take it off. 
and then never put it back on. Right? Or I take my wristband off, I never put it back on. Maybe the next day I put it back on. So we basically built into the software and it's, it's up front, it's a privacy controller that you can then, they can turn it off and then there's a timer and it comes back on later. Uh, so this allows them uh, to disable that information, but importantly, it allows us to get back to the data collection faster. So we don't lose as much data uh, yield in, in the process. And coupled with this um, is, is real-time computation on phones. I know there are projects out there that sample data off of wearables, stream it to a uh, cloud computer, cloud service, does some computation, sends back a result. This is a fine model, but from yesterday's presentations, we're talking about uh, all being all inclusive. We have low SES, uh, and we have some of our projects that exist in those domains. What we've, what I've learned, and what we've learned is, cell towers don't necessarily reach everywhere. So even if they have a cell phone in their house, they might not be connected to the internet for whatever reason. Or they work in a building. Uh, if you work in a hospital, I suspect that can be ha that can happen in certain areas. I don't know about the buildings around UCLA, but there are there are buildings out there where you just even for non SES populations, you can still have no cell connectivity. So we made a decision early on to make sure the computations we needed for intervention purposes were available within the device. Now, there's a ton of challenges related to that, um, mostly technical. So I, I won't go into this time. If you want to know more, we can talk later. The uh, EMA's EMI scheduling is one of those critical, critical pieces that's kind of needed uh, to do the research, to do the interventions. So we built a really robust scheduler into the system. So if you look at the left-hand side of the panel, uh, most scheduling occurs over time, events, or at random. So it's either pre-scheduled, it's randomized in some sort, or uh, it's kind of event triggered. So once you kind of set up the rules around how you want your uh, uh, prompts to occur, then you have to decide, do I have sufficient data for that to occur? And that's what you kind of, the, and then what action do I want to take? So this is where the randomized trials come in, this is where the just-in-time inter adaptive interventions come in. Uh, we've built those algorithms into, or at least versions of those algorithms into this scheduling system. Then you have to decide, what apps do I use? Like, do, is it a notification? Is it a question? Is it uh, an incentive? All, right, all of these are capabilities that are built into the scheduler. So in a lot of our studies, we incentivize participants by paying them effectively micropayments. Right? Answer this questionnaire within five minutes and you get a dollar. Answer it in, within an hour, you get 50 cents. Th things like that. Uh, so this, our platform contains all of this. And what's important here is these are not just time-based. Right. I can have an algorithm, one of those biomarkers, that detects smoking. It says, oh, great, you smoked a cigarette. Now, the event shows up in the scheduler, and now I can prompt them. Whether that's right then and there, whether it's five minutes later, uh, or, or whatever you want to do. This is completely up to the researchers. And at, in, of all the projects I show, I've, I've shown you, not a single project has the same set of scheduling logic. Uh, or a set of rules. They're all different. Where's Billy? Thank you, because you made this life possible. Uh, so interventions and external apps. So, so Billy designed two of the early interventions within MD2K, uh, Mood Surfing and Top Shakeup. Headspace is a commercial app. And it's very important that you be able to call, call these applications as part of that intervention process and reliably ensure that somebody sees them. So the, the, kind of that scheduling framework allows us to make these calls. And if you've built them yourself, you can get a lot more data about what's inside of them. I think you mentioned Headspace, you probably can get as well now. From our conversations, you can get internal data from oh, Headspace. Different, different so yeah. So th there's ways you can get access to some of that information and it's extremely useful <laughs> for your research. Uh, just to kind of wrap that up in terms of the flexibility, there's lots of, this is an example of our study sites. 
Uh, there's lots of interconnected components that exist. So as a kind of a modular framework, you can kind of pick and choose what you want, put them together, and, and then run your studies on top of that. So whether it's different heart targets, different intervention apps, uh, so on and so forth. Another issue we faced within the, the couple of our studies in particular was how to deal with the mobile phones sending data to the cloud services. Now, on a technical level, this is easy. You use the cell phone channel. But on a more of a human participant-centric nature, this gets challenging. So it might be the case that I'm willing to share my house, my work, maybe where I shop. Maybe I'm even willing to share the GPS traces of those locations with the researchers. And in a lot of our studies, we do that. But there are certain studies where you may want to prevent information coming out immediately. So our platform by default <coughs> loads data every 15 minutes to the clouds, the cloud environment. But there, there are certain instances where we just don't want to show that. It may be illegal drugs. It may be, may be locations where you just don't want us to know about. Uh, there was a project with uh, Johns Hopkins on cocaine abuse. In, in this context, this is why this came up. Um, they didn't want to share any of the GPS traces ahead of time. The, they were able to recruit participants with GPS tracing, GPS logging, but not if we could do it in real time. So the phones were built and the, the, the tools were built so that we can at least store that locally and then get, it, get access to it later. And a number of our other studies kind of take the same approach. They, they disable certain things uh, from real time, and that means they can't even see it until those phones come back to the lab. So I think this is just things to think about. So this is kind of all organized in this highly modular architecture where you can kind of add modules, right? If, if you have a developer, you're a computer scientist, or have coding experience, you can write your own modules to put in there. Um, and this is all kind of interconnected within the system. So uh, it's extensible, uh, or you can take what's there and reconfigure it. Uh, so if you want to know technical information details, there's a paper published in 2017 in Census where we kind of go into a lot of the, in the engineering and the, the low level optimizations that we've done to make the real-time interventions and real-time biomarkers possible. So I will attempt to talk through a video rather than do a live demo. So what you're about to see is a video of M Cerebrum kind of from a study coordinator participant standpoint. So the first thing that happens is you log into the system and you're presented with a list of configuration options. These happen to correspond to all of our studies that we've deployed. Uh, robots is Vivex. There's Moffitt, which is a smoking study. So all of these are the different configurations within our service. I'm going to choose one for opioids. And then the system's going to basically <coughs> prompt you to install and configure a bunch of pieces of software. So this is, that, this is that modular components coming in. And it's going to go through and kind of rapidly just go through some panels, but it's showing you what's going on internally in the system. It's going to set up the phone sensor. These are all the types of sensors you can grab from the phone. You can pick and choose what you want. I think it's going to choose the default option, which is most of them. The wrist sensors, uh, we're actually using something called Motion Sense. Uh, it's a custom sensor within MD2K uh, that, in, that sends uh, continuously streaming data to, to the phone. And then the, the study UI, uh, in, in a lot of cases, there's some customizations that are needed. Uh, most commonly, it's a, it's a sleep time and a wake time. So outside of those boundary conditions, you don't want to send them notifications. Like it would be ineffective to send a notification at 2 a.m. if they're sleeping. Right, so, so you, you want to tell the system at least, here, here's the boundary conditions. Uh, so those are, the, those are the different modular, oops, this is not good. Let's see if I can, can I skip? Okay, we'll, we'll resume from here. Uh, let it catch up for a second. Who's setting this up? This is someone setting it up for the patient? Yeah, this is someone setting it up for a participant. Okay. Uh, you won't hear me use the word patient because I'm not in the medical field. Uh, so when I say participants, these are study participants from my perspective. Uh, 
So yes, this would be a lab, a lab, a lab coordinator or somebody that's, that's studying them up, enrolling these participants into these studies. So now what happened is the, the day was just started. So we, we set the wait time, the system started and said, okay, well, you need a survey at the beginning of the day. And these will go kind of rapid fire only because you don't, we don't need to sit here and look at 40 questions in a survey. Question? Yes. With regard to the sensor, is it just a cosmic sensor that you have? You can, so because of the modular nature, you can incorporate others. Okay. Uh, I can talk more about smartwatches later. Okay. Uh, so what happened is the day just started. Now, at the top it says the wrist sensor was good. That was the participant feedback. That means the wrist sensor is sending good data back to the phone. And it's properly worn. If there was a problem, our particular platform has some tutorial videos, help videos, how to diagnose failures. What you're also going to see is you can actually visualize that data. Uh, live. So this is a, just a way, to, uh, so what the coordinators have used in the past is the sensor's not working, they tell them to go into this visualization and they say, describe what you see. And if you don't see anything on the screen, then it goes and does something. Now, we'll come back to that, this is studying privacy. So this is that privacy first uh, architecture. So I'm going to disable the wrist sensors. Now what you'll notice is that data quality will very quickly turn to a red X. And that basically is the system saying, I don't have any data from that sensor. So it's disabled kind of its source. And then when they re-enable it, it goes back to green. So it's, it's kind of right up front, uh, I'm not getting any data. I turn it off, nothing's there. There'll be some other surveys that come through that kind of get a rapid fire here. But just different types of capabilities that you can put into these surveys, whether it's numbers or questions or multiple choice, so on and so forth. So in, uh, let me come back to that, let me finish this, because this doesn't stop. Uh, that's the only problem with, with video demos. Uh, what, what just happened is they're launching a secondary app. So it's not just our system, right? You can write other applications against the platform, and then this is a particular lab protocol. So they wanted a pre, during, and post pain, as a pain study for, for opioids. So they wanted this custom app, so we just wrote the app for them. It's separate from the main software, but it still talks. It still sends all that data into the same core platform. All of this information I will show you here in a few minutes goes out to the cloud service and we can look at it. So, question. Who is responsible for the back end concerns, issues? Is it the researcher's responsibility? So the researchers running the study at this point have to run a back end. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to show you that here in a second. Uh, and then that's, that's why we built the back end as well. So what I want to jump to is cerebral cortex. So I'm going to talk about the back end now. Then I will come into a demonstration. We'll actually go look at my production system. We'll look at real studies, live data right now. And you can see what those study coordinators actually use. Uh, and then following Guy's presentation and like, following the picture, what we can come back and we have a tutorial on how you can kind of look at some of the back end data. So we can give you kind of a, a, an introduction to looking at that information and working with it. Uh, so Cerebral Cortex is our back end cloud component to this. And what this gives us the ability to do is once you run this, it's, a, it's runnable on a, a high end desktop computer for small studies. We happen to run it on a 15 node cluster because of the amount of data we get. Um, uh, I, I, I will say this, I am in one second room. We have run portions of this at scale with 1600 CPUs on Amazon's cloud with about five terabytes of RAM for a particular computation that we need to do. So we know it scales to very large computations. Now that, that's a very atypical use case. Uh, we had to get a computation done in a week and that's the only way we could do it. Uh, so what you can do is you can run one study, you can run n studies, it doesn't matter as long as you have the capabilities within the, kind of your hardware to do it. And you send all that low and high frequency data back to cerebral cortex. And then from there, there's really three use cases that we, we, we see. There's the real-time participant monitoring. So it's one thing to say, here's the phone, here's the hardware, go out in the field for two weeks or a month and then come back. Right? And you as a researcher get no insights into what's going on. Right? That's very hard. So you want to have some sort of real-time monitor that lets you inspect that information. Maybe not all the data, but at least information that says, I'm getting the data I need to get for my research. That's what, that's what, that's what the real-time interface is about. There's also a data science interface, which lets people 
develop new markers, develop new features, process that data, and turn it into kind of new knowledge. And then there's the health research side, which generally speaking leverages a lot of that marker data, uh, or builds some of it. And that's where, that's where all the publications come out. That's where all the new knowledge comes out from these studies. So I want to talk about each use case kind of individually at some point. So from the, from the scalability, these are just particular sites where we've run studies. All of this runs out of a central platform at Memphis, and all of the studies are independent. So Vivek sends data, all of his study participants stream data back to our, our servers. All of the other sites that we've had around the country have streamed data back to our servers. And that's all kind of aggregated into the one platform. Uh, so to speak about kind of machine learning a little bit, uh, cerebral cortex gives us the ability to compute features, but also to leverage features from other sources, even so the phones produce some features. What you basically do is extract all those features out into a, effectively a vector. Combine them all into this vector, add some labels, and then run those through as machine learning algorithm. All right. From there, you kind of go out and build models. Uh, you train these models. Now, these models could become publications in and of themselves. So these, these, these become kind of validated models if you've done all the proper research here, proper study designs. Or these models could exist as published work as well. So we just leverage those. Once they exist, then you can compute all these biomarkers. So whether that's smoking, stress, eating, location, activity, I'm sure we could ask around the room and come up with several hundred. Okay. I, I don't know. Uh, ultimately, those effectively get stored back within the system. And these is, is where the, the health researchers or the data scientists kind of kick in and pull those model, pull that model information, generate more research, generate more knowledge, right? More publications come out of that. Uh, then this loop kind of can cycle through, right? So this is not just like data, model, publication. It's data, model, data, model, data, model, data, model, publication, right? You can kind of cycle through this. And as of right now, the machine learning is just external tools. So you can take any off-the-shelf machine learning tool, and once you have these features, apply them. So in order to make kind of the scalability process, or the scalability of this effective, we've combined some technologies together, uh, specifically Python, which is a programming language that's uh, typically used in data science, um, plus Apache Spark, which is a distributed framework which gives us the scalability to, to, to run this on, on very large data sets. Uh, and then we've added additional metadata through one of our research projects. Um, to kind of facilitate understanding of this information. Because I, I will tell you this, if you leave an engineer to build this, you get no documentation, and you really don't know how it goes from A to B. Uh, but as a researcher, you, you actually need to know that how did I get my smoke, how, how was my smoking event, or my stress event, actually produced? Right? You need some sort of provenance information all the way back to the source to really have an understanding of what's going on. So this combined, this is broken. Uh, gives it gives you the ability to concurrently kind of build a bunch of markers, and in particular, we built a library of over 400 markers with a set of research, uh, graduate students in about four months for one project. Uh, so, because of the standardized metadata, they were able to understand what was going on, even amongst <coughs> themselves, and then we were able to kind of kind of build this out. Uh, just as a Brief example of some of the markers that exist within the system. There's a bunch of classes, whether it's posture or activity, smoking, uh, workplace behavior, and that was for a particular project. Once we built these features, though, they exist within the library, then anybody that leverages the platform gains access to that. So we've so we've or somebody else, no, it's not just actually we, uh, MD2K or any researcher that's going to contribute to the platform. Uh, those algorithms kind of exist in these repositories and then can be run. So I mentioned real-time study monitor. This is just an example of what it looks like. We'll, we'll look at this in detail with a live demo. Uh, so this gives you the ability to visualize data, alert on information. 
There's also kind of the data science world where you have this different type of interface where you can programmatically interact with it. So the tutorial session this afternoon will give a, a very brief demonstration of how this works and let you kind of go in and play with some data. Uh, there's also the kind of structured data. So everything I've talked about so far has been M Cerebrum, our mobile phone, sending data to the cloud. That's not the only way to get data there. Let's say you have your own structured data. I've collected my data from whatever device I have, and I want to use it, to, I want to analyze it in this platform. Right? There's, there's import mechanisms that allow you to ingest your own data, and then you can leverage those algorithms as well. So kind of just to summarize, it's the scalability of this thing is not completely about just participants. It's also about the availability of algorithms, the speed at which you can kind of contribute that, uh, in terms of the number of studies or the amount of data that's in the system. Uh, but it's also about the diversity. So we're talking about everything from a, a low-level risk-based motion data to a very high-level EMA. All of that is kind of combined into one platform, which then you can start doing analysis on top of. Um, so, if so this is how we typically see a life cycle of a study. So you kind of go out there, you create that cerebral cortex platform, right? You launch it somewhere. Desktop computer, Amazon Cloud, somewhere in between. Going, I'm going to configure my mobile software, deploy it, test it. Now I'm kind of internal, internal to my group. Uh, I'm going to start configuring what we call dashboards. So this is that monitoring interface. Then at this point, you're going to deploy it to your participants. What's nice about a platform like this, and, and there are others, is you can begin your data analysis before your first participant ever comes back to the lab and completes. So once you deploy them, you start getting data. Now you can start looking at it. Is this the data I want? Now maybe one's not enough, maybe it's five or 10, but you can still get that information and very rapidly start doing data analysis um, while you're monitoring this participant data. At some point, you're gonna conclude the study, but before you get there, you're gonna develop new markers, right? Whether they're new features that you want on top of your data, Maybe they change the interventions you want to do. Doesn't it can be anything, right? So basically, then at this point, you just repeat as needed before your study is ever completed. This goes kind of hand in hand with uh, the micro randomization stuff and the, the adaptive interventions. So you can kind of rapidly repeat this process. So I told you I would jump over here. Let's see if this is going to work. And it's not working. This way? This way. Yeah. So this is uh, an open source tool called Grafana. Can everybody see that? I need to get bigger. No complaints? Good. Um, so this is one of our studies. This is live data updated as of the, well, you know, we're sure updated as of now. Um, so I, this is not pre-prepared. I'm, I'm going to learn what's in here just like you will. Um, so this is one of the participants. So what we've set up for this particular study is a set of users. There's, these are all, oops, these are all, these are all the participant IDs within the system. These are all, this is all data that's active uh, in this dashboard. Uh, and this particular study is going to be running about 300 smoking cessation participants in the field. So then there's things like, I can turn on, let me turn on stress. I don't know if this is going to work or not, we'll see. Uh, they have an, the coordinators care about the incentive values. What, that's the first thing the participants ask for when they, when they come back to the lab. What am I getting paid? So we put that up front, <laughs> right? But what else I can also tell from them is how many days were started? How many days were ended in the platform? There's a, there's a start of day and end of day process, right? How many EMAs were sent? How many EMAs, uh, sorry, what was the yield of the risk data? So just looking at this, I can get a sense that there's, a, there's not very good risk data on the left wrist. I, I see one hour out of the whole thing, there's 18 hours on the right wrist. Uh, there's e this particular one has ECG, so obviously ECG is, being, is one of our more stable signals if, if we were deploying it. There's 72 hours, so there's a disconnect right now between the ECG and the right, the right wrist and the left wrist. Yeah. Um, this could, 
and I can't speculate, I won't, I won't even speculate. This could be because of, for a lot of reasons. Uh, it, the sensor's not attached properly, it's too much for the phone, uh, it's skin tone, it's, who knows? It, it could just be weight, it could be anything. Uh, amount of hair on the arm, it, I, don't, I don't know, because I, I actually don't know who this participant is. Don't know anything about any of these participants intentionally. Um, but what's, what happens below this is some more, more information. So then you start getting hourly breakdowns of information, uh, incentive <coughs> breakdowns. But this is the yield. So we can actually go in here and look at this. And because this is all dynamic, let's see if I can, yeah, I can start zooming in on information. Let me turn one of these things off. Yeah, that's a little cleaner. Uh, so what we're looking at here, let's look at this one over here. Uh, we'll just pick one day. So, uh, so this particular this 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 particular day, I don't know what it is. We see we see good yield, poor yield, and then good yield. So th this is something that now you can, now as a kind of a coordinator you can say well if it's all if it's all bad, I know something's wrong. I can pick up the phone and call them. I can email them. I can at least intervene to try to improve my study's data yield. Uh, in this particular context, uh, I don't know which one's which. Let's find out. Um, oh, smoking episodes. So this is the start and end of a smoking episode. Oh, these, actually, sorry, these are two different smoking episodes. So because this is a smoking cessation project, this is probably early on in the days. The, they don't quit smoking until like day four or something within the study. So this is actually the algorithms picking up a smoking episode, displaying it to you, so you can actually see they smoked at this time. Uh, so you can kind of configure all of this all of this data within the system. Um, this is incentive payments. So let me let me jump over to another one and let's just try this. Um, where is it? Oh, it's pinned. So this is the study for the video that I showed you earlier with this room. This is the pain study. And I haven't checked this ahead of time, so we're going to learn together if there's anything out there. There is. Let's see. Ah, perfect. We're lucky today. So for the pain study, uh, we're looking at what medications were set in the system uh, as, a, as, a way, as a way to know it. How many diaries were reported? How many self-reports? How many prompts were delivered? How many days were started? So we're Looks like about two weeks into the, or two weeks and some change into this. This is that vital information, right? These are the, the pre, during, post vitals that that they collected within that app. So they put the, the the lab the lab study punched it into the app. The dashboard picks it up 15 minutes later, uh, so it's available. And then we can look at this. So in this particular graph, these are the cumulative pain assess self reports, the white dots here, and then within this context of this. This is, hopefully this is interesting. Huh. I guess they reported zero pain during the, that's weird. Anyways, so these are the pain levels that are self-reported and put into the coordinator app. So, that, so that's kind of the, what, what's going on in the lab study. And if we look at these, all these dots correspond to different things like self-reports, event contingent prompting, so they just tell you when when they occurred, and you can zoom in temporally and, and kind of look at them. But then we can kind of look at just this data yield. Um, so the nice thing, like I said, the nice thing about these interfaces is it allows you to dive down, look at a month of data, or look at a day of data, or an hour of data. And like I said, all of this comes out from the mobile phones into the cloud and is available. So let's see back to the presentation. So there's a couple of things that are ongoing. Uh, we have a project called Improv, and this is designed to ex uh, improve the, the provenance, the end-to-end -end traceability of signals. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but this is especially important to have kind of tracing across everything from a wearable sensor all the way to a cloud-based cloud algorithm. And it also helps, us, it's helping us standardize the metadata. Uh, so one of the challenges is how do I find this information? If you don't have, if you have standardized metadata, then you can at least, you know what it is, and you know where it came from, or maybe even you know what publication it came out of. 
So you can go back to the original research and say this algorithm is built from this particular location. Uh, and then there's another project called InResearch, which is our push from NIH, I think it's NIH funding, to build to make it more easily deployable, more extensible, also adding things like signal simulators in there. So if you don't have signals, you can simulate them. And then you can still run the algorithms or kind of replicate that. So the, the classic example that is always told to me is I have an ECG and I want to simulate PPG, which is the uh, optical sensor in your smartwatch that gives heart rate. So you can do, they're, they're building algorithms to do that from the raw signals. And maybe they'll flip it around and go PPG to ECG, I don't know. Uh, but then also enabling reproducibility and then potentially adding Internet of Things into this picture. So. Uh, like, like it was mentioned earlier, this is all available. It's all open sourced. It's on our GitHub account. So you can go there and you can find all of the code, all the systems that run this. Um, we have a bunch of documentation available on our website. Also, there's a, a read the docs for the, the actual core, which if you're, that's, that's, I, I would say that's more for a developer centric <laughs> audience that the read the docs. And then there's these other capabilities uh, where we published it out on the standard platforms and containerized it and then even have Amazon EC2 EMR instances where you can kind of run this within five minutes and then you can have a working platform. So I'm going to stop there. Um, any questions? <coughs> It's not part of the plan to sort of uh, be able to close the loop using the system. What do you mean close the loop? Being able to, to make calculations and make decisions and then go back to the previous practices. I, I would say it is, it, it is a plan. Uh, but early on, we made a design choice. And that was to anything that was participant-centric for intervention <laughs> purposes or Things that they will control direct, or they, they will need direct access to, is computable on the cell phone itself. Um, what you what we could envision as a future, and that's part of the accessibility question, we train a model in the cloud, right? We improve that model in the cloud. We do want to send that model back to the phone, and let the phone evaluate it. Yeah, yeah. but if you want to like be able to run a, a quadratic program on C plus. It's not that it can't be done on the phone, but it's easier doing it externally. Yeah, I, I will say this. It's, there's nothing about this architecture that prevents you from doing that. It just, we haven't built it yet. So somebody else could build it and add it in. So when you don't have to comment, I, mean, I will say that uh, this is great. I mean, this is fantastic. The first time I've, I've heard this presented, and you know, coming from the chemical industry, you know, a lot of the enablers, you know, for control out the decision you know, is the standardized information systems and you know distributed control systems that basically allow people to just go and and, and, and put their stuff in without having to worry about mm -hmm. a lot of the information details. So I mean maybe this is a step towards M health having Yeah, it would be an M health version of that. Yes. Yeah. So it was, oh, yes. Um, do you speak a little bit about the um, cost of the researchers? Like, is there any cost associated with storing the data? So, what I'm not, so I'm not, I'm not hosting this for you. So, the cost to run this, the software is free. The cost you have to run this is hardware, if you're if you're using it for the for the for the, the participants, right? That could be a custom watch. I have one. If you want to see it later, I can show it. You can come up so you can see it. I have one of our custom hardware units, right? It could be a smartwatch. It could just be cell phone data, right? If, 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 if it's their cell phone and you're just collecting it off of, the, off of their phone sensors, the cost is basically free at that point. Uh, from a server standpoint, let's just take a, a study with an N of 100, right? So I'm gonna run 100 participants for two weeks, right? If I use our standard sensor package, I can run that study on a desktop computer, right? Give me a terabyte of storage, which is more than wait, more more than enough, and a four core CPU, so a, a two or three thousand dollar computer, right? I can run the entire study off of that platform and do all my analysis on it. That's my that's my cost, right? 
what I've described is, is a scaling question, right? As we scale up these studies, and I hope that, that the future be, becomes much larger studies, technology like this and others can help grow R01 projects from running 100 participants to maybe running 1,000 or more. Right? As we scale that, then, then the computation in the back end starts changing. Right? I go from my $2,000 computer to my $10,000 computer. Right? Uh, what we've done is kind of went, went kind of to an extreme level with what we've kind of computed, but again, we're we're also learning, right? We didn't know what we needed, and some of the algorithms that we've been testing that we don't I don't show uh, were very computationally intensive. Uh, this is why I needed 32 compute years on Amazon's cloud. I did it in five days, but I needed 32 compute years to run one feature computation, uh, primarily because the algorithm wasn't optimized and we had to run it. Uh, so I couldn't, if I wanted to run that on my computer infrastructure, it would have taken three and a half months. I did it in Amazon in five days. That's uh, just one, one example. But again, we had a deadline, so we had to meet that. Uh, so, the, so you can basically trade money for time in, in a lot of cases here, uh, as long as you have enough basic storage to compute the data. Um, for some of the, the smartphone kind of sensor data that you provided information about how turning on the sensor for the slog might impact the I'm going to encourage you to go read the paper okay. because the paper breaks down every sensor uh, type and the impact on power. Uh, so that, that interim paper will describe everything you, you're probably asking for. Okay. Right. This was fantastic. So great. I'm curious about the linkages into sorry, two, two comments and then to get to the question, right? One of the ways I've been thinking about open source is sort of like when you get to 80% of what you need done, then it usually then you can start building a community around it, mm -hmm. right? But until you hit that sort of 80% critical mass, it's hard to get to you know, enough people building. And I feel like you guys are getting really close, which is wonderful. I, 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 I'm glad to hear you say that because I'm, I'm hoping that's true. <laughs> I, 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 I hope it's true too, because I've been wondering. <laughs> but I don't know if it's true, but I hope it's true. But then the follow up is, is like when you're really trying to build a good system platform, you need a balance of different uh, you know, types of groups. So, so I'm particularly thinking about industry groups. And so I'm thinking about uh, platforms that could potentially build on top of this in a modular fashion. And I'm just curious of how, have you guys been exploring that uh, and thinking about that? Uh, and I'm also thinking about this in terms of like, once you're done with your study, how do you then flip this into a deployment so you can actually do a scaled intervention? I could also think about for those who don't necessarily want to set up their own platform, building out those services where you're the back end and, and they're using all the work and then they contribute and then everything people build, it still is open source, so it's still yeah. science, but it's like making it easier for people. Yeah, like so there's the, uh, yeah, 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 I see what you're saying. In terms of industry partnerships, uh, that's a tough one. Uh, I, I, I think there's a, there's a disconnect between industry and what we do. Uh, it's very obvious. Um, I have a custom sensor on my wrist right now. Like the only reason I have the sensor is because there was no commercial device that can give me the data that I need for the, the duration that I need. I'm streaming data for 24 hours on the battery, uh, so basically an entire day, at 25 samples per second across nine dimensions. Accelerometer, gyroscope, PPG. Um, I stream that to my phone. And it lasts. The best device we found to date, uh, now this is a couple years ago, was the Microsoft Fan. It lasted nine hours, brand new. And then they discontinued the whole thing. Uh, so we actually had the Microsoft Fan as a smartwatch deployed in our congestive heart failure study. And then they got rid of it and, uh, well, we just kind of ignored the code and moved on. Uh, if, I want to say that if, if we can show, I mean, we in this group and others, if you can show the value of those markers to people, they're going to demand that that exists. Once that demand exists, industry will follow. That's the 80% argument. Yes, that, that's, that's it. Yeah, well, uh, there's 80% there's of senses that 80% to the research group. Yes. Then, there's, then there's the question of how do we get industry to catch up? Uh, so right now, we're very constrained in terms of the hardware that we can use, simply because we want to do all of this stuff. Once I build those markers, then it's easy to optimize down and put it into a pivot or, or whatever commercial device is out there. So, so that, that's the challenge. And then your second part was about hosting. Uh, we as a center have, have stayed away from the concept of hosting others' data. 
as a as a research institution, you'll find this with IRBs. A lot of IRBs don't like having your having data go outside of their their their, their, contain, their confines of their universities. Now we've been able to work through that because of our, the collaboration agreements we have with all the people we work with. But if that were to happen, I, I would anticipate that would become a, some other third party company. Maybe they get created just to man, help, help run and manage studies. Uh, but that's not something that we've ever kind of, kind of invested in or looked at. So I, that's how I could see that happening. Um, and just to be clear, I was thinking much more about the second, like trying to make it because not, not everyone is going to be able to build up their own uh, yeah. back end. Yeah, sure. Except at, at a small scale. Our goal uh, is is to have this deployable on a desktop computer with within like five five minutes ten minutes by by anybody they can at least follow a set of web page instructions right I want to get a lot of the technical out of it and we've made a lot of strides towards that I, I won't show it today uh, but there's uh, virtual machines that you can download and just run and this thing would come pre set up within that uh, there's also things like Docker if we go a little bit more technical. Uh, this whole thing is based on Docker. Everything that I'll show you in the, the tutorial, it's all running inside of Docker containers. It happens to be on a server, but it happens to be all within Docker containers. So we're kind of eating our own dog food. Like, I, I want it to be, I want it to be Docker. I want it to be containerized. Well, we we run the containers. I don't I don't just do other things and then tell everybody else. So we're definitely doing that. So I hope I hope in the near future we'll get to that point where everybody else can start using this. So, thank you. Okay, we'll get to here again.